is electric. Hi everyone, welcome back for another energy related video. It's the 9th of November here in Norfolk and it's time to give you the stats for October. What's been going on here and how have we been getting on with solar and energy consumption? There's some good things to share, but before I do, I was really tempted not to do this video today because I've been delaying and delaying. I've had a busy week and uh, yesterday I went to see the Volvo EX30 and wow, what a car seeing it in the flesh. You know, you've seen the review, you've seen people rave about it and it looks cute in the pictures and the marketing. But in the flesh, there's quite a lot to tell you about and there's a big decision to be made. So I, I can't wait to do that video. Um, I took some footage of the car yesterday. But yeah, I want to get on camera and tell you about what I think. But that's not what today's about. Today's about the stats and the solar. And the theme of the video for this month of October is the transition, the transition between summer and winter. September, you could sort of feeling it coming and you could feel it get colder. But uh, October's the month where you reach that point where there's not enough solar the next day and you think you're going to have to charge your battery overnight. Just getting to the point where you need the heating on, you turn the heating on and once it's on, you feel comfortable and you're starting to adjust to a different different temperature and a different way of feeling the different season is really with you last year i think it was about the 16th or 17th of october where that switch over really happened and this year i think it was just slightly before we went away in the middle of october but by the time we came back yeah the seasons had changed like today it's five degrees outside it's pretty cold the heating's on i've got uh, air conditioning going on the air to air heat pump and uh, the house is nice and warm hence i'm sat here in a t-shirt and uh, yeah, I guess everyone else is going through that transition and turning the heating on and charging batteries overnight and your car gets charged overnight instead of solar during the day. But what do you actually have to do? You know, I, I get comments sometimes and I think about, you know, can Susan run this system? You know, is it complicated with a battery and three solar arrays and all these electrical devices? You know, I've got different heaters and different rooms, all those sort of things. Is it complicated? Or is it not? How much more complicated is it than an old system? So I've, I've just been sitting back a little bit thinking about it. And the reality when you look at it objectively is, well, Susan doesn't know how to use the heating system anyway. And when they're installed new, the timers on gas and oil boilers, they're not great, are they? I mean, you've got auto, on or off and boost. And that sounds all right. But then you've got this thing where you have to go into, in, into each individual day copy the day, two sets of timers on and off, and that's all you get, two sets, but then per day, and you copy them to each day to make sure it works, and a different set of timers for the hot water. So actually, it's quite complicated, and Susan doesn't know how to use that timer and wouldn't have a clue, and God knows where the manual is for it. So old central heating systems, people might think, oh, you just turn the thermostat up or just turn it on, and that's all it is, but in the background, there's a bit more to it. So. In the background, there's a bit more to my battery solution and all these solar arrays and the heating timers. Yeah, there is a bit more to it, but what do I actually have to do going between the summer settings and the winter settings to actually turn it on to make this system work differently in the different mode? And I thought I'd share that with you and then ask the question, what do you do for your system? How easy is it or complicated is it to do that transition from summer to winter and to start to charge overnight? You know, I'm aware, for example, solar edge systems, um, if you've got a solar edge battery, then changing those profiles has been in the past. And I'm not sure if solar edge have changed it yet, but it was a install only type of thing. So it's set up once when you install it and you can't change it again, not on your own. I think that's coming to change so customers can change it themselves. But do you have to do that? Can you do it? How complicated is it? Same as for your heating as well. How many thermostats do you have to adjust? How many timers do you have to reset? How complicated is it really? So for us, the first thing we have to do is turn the battery off so it's not discharging during the night. Instead, it's charging on cheap rate energy, recharging from Octopus Intelligent. From my Android tablet, I select VRM. That's the Victron Remote Monitoring System. That loads up with a monitoring platform, but I can then click on the options and go to remote console. That fires up all the parameters and settings for ESS, the uh, system that's handling the battery. And in there, I've got schedules and they're disabled. I just select enabled and then it's set for every day from midnight till 530 in the morning.
that's it. Then I can close it down, shut it down, and that's it. My battery will shut down at midnight and stop discharging, and it will start charging up from the grid instead. And if you're wondering why I've started it at midnight, not half past 11 at night, because Octopus Intelligent Go starts at half past 11, I don't need the full six hours, and I'd rather the grid draw started on a new day boundary, not last thing at night. So that's the only reason I've set it to midnight. Then there's the heating systems. Uh, most of the smart plugs that I use for all the individual heaters, they're all done from the same app, the CASA Smart app. I use the same brand of smart plugs for all of them, so it's in one place. And I just need to go in and change the schedules for them. This is in real time and how easy it is. So just find the one we want, the cloakroom radiator, select the schedules, turn it on because the scheduled time should already be there on some of them i might want to actually adjust the time if i see that there's a slight adjustment to be made or i made a change last year but it should just be enabling them so select each radiator each plug and enable it turn the schedule on i always leave the off schedule still on and still working so it always turns it off even if it's never been turned on so it's only the on that i have to do if that makes sense and there's the third one or is that the fourth one i can't remember now Oh, look, Wi-Fi was a little bit slow there on connecting to it. And I'm going to change the time. Instead of 5, let's have it at 4.40 that it comes on. And down the bottom, you've got the repeat of how many days you're going to repeat. It, by default, repeats on every single day. And I have the same times every day of the week, but it's easy to change. It's more intuitive than the old heating systems. Again, this is real time. I wanted to show you how long it really takes. I mean, we must be over a minute now but it's not that long. It would take longer for me to go outside into the cold garage and turn the actual heating schedules on. And then because I've got multiple heating systems, I've got the Toshiba air-to-air -air heating. So I go back to the Android tablet, select the Toshiba app, and it looks like this. Then there's a timing button at the top. I select that and it gives me the schedule of timing. So for each individual device, I can set the timers. Clicking on the hall one, the off timer on time one is already set for 5.30 to go off, so I just need to set a second timer to turn it on. So select the on button, select heat rather than cool or fan, select the temperature that I want, and I'm going to set the hall to 19 degrees. This is exactly the same system as, as I would set it if I was just turning the system on now. So it's very intuitive, it's very obvious. So set to 19, fan speed normal, and the time... Let's set that to, what, 4 o'clock? Yeah, so 4 o'clock in the morning, the hall heating is going to come on. That's it done. And the repeat is for every day of the week to have it exactly the same. So it's a nice, easy system to use. I quite like this one. Then on to the bedroom unit, which will be slightly different. So again, the off timer is already set, so I just need to turn the timer on. The time I'm going to select is 4.30. Now turn the physical unit on as part of the timer, so it's on. Select heating again, so it's not cooling. Select a temperature, uh, 17 degrees this time, and importantly, silent. So not in auto this time, not with a high fan speed. Nice and silent, so it comes out very gently and slowly and doesn't wake us up first thing in the morning. That's it. That's all we have to set. Um, once that's done, down at the bottom, repeat is set to every day, so we're good to go. Personally, I don't think that's complicated. What do you think? Just once a year to change this sort of thing? It's not difficult, is it? Right, let's move on. Let's talk about stats. Let's start with grid import. So 2021 for the entire year, we used 1,377 kilowatt hours. Let's look at the annual side to start with just for a change. So in 2022, that increased because we added electric heating to 2,122.98 kilowatt hours. You can see the difference there between when it's high in the early parts of the year and then the end parts of the year. Same again, but currently we're at 1,156 kilowatt hours for the year. High in January, low in February, a bit higher in March. You can see it increasing now in October. Presuming we use, say, 500 kilowatt hours in both November and December, that's 2,156 kilowatt hours. That's about on target. I think we're doing quite well. Grid import for the month of October, just 129 kilowatt hours. And it's split there, isn't it? It looks like we needed to import a little at the start of the month. Then there was a good, what, that must be 10 days or so in the middle where we didn't import any and I was still using just solar energy. Then we had the cold snap, needed the heating, charged the cars, importing more from the grid at the end of the month. 
Looking at solar generation for the month of October, 507 kilowatt hours in total, and it's pretty decent. I'm really not sure from this graph why we imported in the start of October, because we had a decent amount of solar energy. But anyway, that's what actually happened. But uh, as you can see, towards the end of the month, quite a few days there, we were under 5 kilowatt hours. That's why we're importing from the grid these days. So the breakdown for that, our Solus Array, that's 3.9 kilowatts of solar panels, 3.6 kilowatt inverter, that's the one that we've got the fit tariff with, 266 kilowatt hours. Our latest Solus Array, that's 2.5 kilowatts in power on the inverter, 2.9 kilowatts of solar panels in total, but they're split between two areas and there's a lot of shade during the day. Now with the lower sun as well, just 88 kilowatt hours, so that's a lot less than I've been having over other months. And our solar edge array, that's a 2 kilowatt inverter, 2.4 kilowatts of solar panels, that generated 153 kilowatt hours. Luckily, it's still reporting accurate information for generation, even though it's not for import and export anymore. So plugging that data into the spreadsheet chart that I look to compare to previous years, October this year at 266 was a lot less than 358 last year. But actually, looking further back for the other three years, is the second best October we've had. So it wasn't that bad, but it wasn't anywhere near as good as last year. So 266 from one array, 153 from the other one, and 88 from the latest array that we had compared to last year, which was 124. So a big dip for uh, that third array that we've got. I like to look at this chart as well, the long-term data for all of the individual arrays, and it shows year on year how the flow of energy, you're getting more in summer and less in winter. And yeah, on the right-hand side of this chart, you can see the big dip in October compared to September. So we're really generating a lot less now. So battery-wise, this is only the start of the winter period, so of course the battery is surviving and we're running just on battery, not importing from the grid during peak time. So if you look at the scale on this chart, the right-hand side blue scale from 100% down to zero, the more the blue at the top of the graph creeps down to the bottom of that scale, the more of the battery we're using overnight, and the gaps, the triangles that you can see at the top of the blue area of the chart, that's whether we've charged to 100% overnight as well, or during the day from solar. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven days where we didn't charge to 100%, and only a couple of days where we dipped down to 50% battery capacity. So looking at the My Energy data, which is slightly different, it doesn't count exactly the same, so the import and export are different and the generation numbers are actually slightly different, but this shows a good mix of what's actually going on in the month. It's saying 501 generated, 508 consumed, 366 was consumed from the green energy, from the solar, and we let slip out 133 out to the grid on export. And because of that, we had to import as well 141 kilowatt hours. So that shows the breakdown, 72% green using mostly solar energy, 500 kilowatt hours, that's my magic number, 500 kilowatt hours and we're hardly using anything from the grid. If you're new to this and wondering why on earth does one app show 141 kilowatt hours, when I've said earlier we only uh, actually used 129 kilowatt hours from the grid. The difference is the meters. Different apps are using different meters, CT clips or physical meters, and some are more accurate than others. And obviously the one from Octopus Energy, what we've actually used, that's what we're being charged for, that's the most accurate. Talking of export, this is the chart for that, 144 kilowatt hours exported for the month. If you look at the right-hand side of the graph, you can see that it's dipped a lot from the summer numbers, so we're now exporting a lot less. This My Energy chart shows it quite well with the yellow spikes going down. It shows which days we exported when we had more solar energy or we didn't use very much, and how many days in the month there were where we hardly exported anything. With all these different apps and lots of data, there's lots of charts, and this one I don't actually show you very often. In fact, I don't actually think I've included this in a monthly video before. This is from the Victron VRM system, and it's showing me grid usage. Now in the orangey-yellow color, it's the amount of grid we're importing generally, but for the blue, it's where we're charging the battery from the grid import. So it's showing me here, it took all the way until the 21st of October before we started charging the battery from the grid, apart from a little test in the beginning of the month. It's a good opportunity to be able to say that this is one of the reasons why I like a mixture of different systems and different charts and different software platforms. The alternative views and the way of looking at things can be really handy sometimes to understand what's going on. 
And an alternative look at our solar generation for the month, this from Home Assistant, showing the amount of power we're getting. So not how many kilowatt hours a day, but the actual instantaneous power. So the peak is the peak maximum power that we got from the solar array during the day. So we're not peaking much above six kilowatts for a lot of the days. But as well as looking at the peak, look how low it is on some days. Around the 20th of October, that was barely generating anything, maybe 100, 200 watts throughout the day. Tracking temperatures, both inside and outside, is quite key to understanding your energy usage, especially when you're using electric heating. So I've changed this graph here just to report uh, two things. Our hallway, so let's, let's call that internal temperature in the purple, and then the uh, loft temperature, which is pretty much the outside temperature. Only one day in the month it dipped below 5 degrees, but you can see towards the end of the month, yeah, it is getting a lot colder. So we know we consumed 500 odd kilowatt hours of energy, both from the grid and solar. But where did it go? Which devices use how much energy? Starting at the top, the highest consuming device was the Zappi, importing from the grid, charging our EVs, 88 kilowatt hours. Next down, 67 kilowatt hours for the eddy, heating hot water in the Mixergy tank. Air conditioning, our main heat source, that was the third, at 53 kilowatt hours. And then we've got the kitchen, 44 kilowatt hours. That's the washing machine, the oven, part of the hobs, the air fryer, toaster, microwave, all of those things. Then the Zappi from solar, just 44 kilowatt hours was charging electric cars on solar, not as much available. The ensuite radiator, 16 kilowatt hours, well, almost. The oven and hob, so yeah, I've got one hob that's separate, and that's 12 kilowatt hours, that's the main hob. The internet router and home assistant hub, 9.4 kilowatt hours. The Eddy heating hot water from the grid, 8.77 kilowatt hours. The dehumidifier, 8 kilowatt hours. The cloakroom infrared radiator, 8 kilowatt hours. The TV in the lounge, 5.8 kilowatt hours. The cloakroom, 5.7 kilowatt hours. That's the immersion radiator. We've got two heaters in that. And we've got a second fridge in the garage, which is now turned off, 4 kilowatt hours. And that's about it. That's the breakdown of energy usage. The My Energy app doesn't show that breakdown of between grid and solar usage. So for the Eddy, 74.5 kilowatt hours. For the Zappi, charging our cars, 132.3 kilowatt hours. That's merged between what comes from solar and what comes from the grid. And yep, the house, 312 kilowatt hours. So whilst we're talking about charging electric cars, it's worth saying I can't see the data anymore in Home Assistant for our Volkswagen Golf. The license has run out, but the Mini, the data is still coming through, so I can see the mileage of the car incrementing. We're just over 9,600 miles now. This chart's an interesting one, though, tracking the state of charge of the battery. So when it's at 100%, you can see that we've charged it completely full. And then when, when it's almost empty, you know, we've been on a long drive the day before and we're waiting to recharge it. Yeah, and that sweet spot, I'm starting to charge more to 80%. In the Mini, I don't really worry about it as much as I do in the other cars that I've had. And the last chart, what's the GOM saying on the Mini? So how many miles of range have we got left on the Mini? And when it's fully charged, it's showing around 120. But as I've told you before on many videos, the Mini is always pessimistic. I can always do more than whatever it says on the GOM. And if you're new to this and wondering what GOM is, it's a guesser meter It guesses how many miles you can do on the battery you've got left. Moving on now to water consumption. Yes, we've got a smart water meter as well that tells us the amount of mains water we're using. It's actually had a problem. It hasn't been working properly for a couple of months, and hence we've got an estimated reading. But it's now back working again, and October has been a very low usage month for us with water. We've been away for a few days in the middle of the month, but also we're very economical. There's also a day-by-day -day usage chart as well, so we can see how much water we're using on each individual day. The grey days there, that's because the meter was estimated, so that's where it was just starting to come back online. Blue is where we've got an accurate reading. And as you can see, the highest day there, 256 litres, and the lowest day, absolutely zero, because we were away on holiday, not using any water at all, so no leaks. That's brilliant, so that's a good use of this uh, water meter, isn't it, to see whether you've got a leak or not. So October in total, 3,425 litres of cold water from the mains. So how much of that water usage was hot water? So if I look at the stats from our Mixergy hot water tank, 2,055 litres were estimated to be used for hot water in October. 
that surprises me. That's quite a large proportion of water, isn't it? 2,055 versus 3,425 actual water consumed. But 2,000 litres to 2,300 litres, that's roughly what we use each month hot water-wise. And from the data before, don't forget, 74 kilowatt hours to heat that hot water for the month. This chart is showing the current charge, how full the hot water tank is. So 100%, we've got all of the water up to temperature. And when it's down to 50%, only half the tank is at the hot temperature. And uh, the rest of the tank is cold or lukewarm. Because this tank, the Mixergy tank, is split into two sections. You've got a cold water section and a hot water section. The hot water section, as it gets heated up, goes up to about a maximum of 56. But as you can see on this chart, we've always got some hot water on most days around 50 degrees. And only on a few occasions when we're using lots does it drop down below that. The cold water section depends on how cold the input water is. So the colder it is, like winter now, it'll be down to about 10 degrees at the moment. Where in summer, it might be 20 degrees. So that's the end of the stats for the month. Quite a detailed report this month. Hope that was interesting for you. I hope there's some stats there that you enjoyed and let me know your thoughts in the comments. As always, thank you so much for watching. Look forward to sharing with you, especially about that Volvo. Can't wait to share that with you. So hopefully I'll be editing that video up over the weekend if I get a chance. Thanks again for watching. See you again soon for more videos. Bye for now.